You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. That's right. We did credits because we didn't, uh, we wanted to thank all the people involved and we wanted you to know that this wasn't just this singular thing. We thought, oh, let's give this a whirl. Um, I'll be honest, it was a huge production effort because we as a church think that you learn far more by what you hear and see um, in, in living action than you do just by me talking. So um, thank you to all the people who took part in this. I want to tell you something you may not know, but when we shot those videos, it was 39 degrees and it was at the beach and we were barefoot all day and the wind blew 25 miles an hour and it was, it was a special version of pain. And I got in my car and I put my foot on the accelerator accelerator to leave and it felt weird. And I'm like, what is that? It made a weird scuffing sound. I'm like, oh, I pulled my foot up. That dude was frozen solid. It was like a turkey. I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I thought I had gangrene, but it warmed back up. And then halfway home, right around Captain Sunday, I had to pull over because it was tingling so bad. I was like, oh, it's awake. So yeah. There's more information than you wanted. Welcome to the Foundry. As we get going tonight, we are in our final installment on the series of Joseph. And if you recognize what's going on, if you understand Scripture at all, and if you don't understand Scripture, we know this. When an epic is played, when a biblical epic or an epic uh, movie or something is played, you get you get drawn into the story. We've been drawn into the life of Joseph all summer long. And it feels like, if I'm honest, we could go on with this series for another three months. We didn't get into it nearly as much as we had hoped. And um, you may be tired of it, but I am not, because I will tell you this, in the life of Joseph, we see a forerunner of Christ. We see someone who had the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will come out again today You'll hear and experience some things of Joseph. As we wrap this up and put a bow on it, we need to understand that we've gone Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 37 through Genesis 44. The, the story doesn't end until Genesis 50. So we're going to lump this last few chapters together, and we're going to work through it as we kind of lean in on this idea. There's a single word we're going to talk about, providence, so much more than a city in Rhode Island right? Providence. What does providence mean? What is providence when we look at it? Um, Maybe we could say providence is God taking all the bad things in life and using them for his good. God not being bound to circumstances. Providence means that God indeed is able to make beauty out of ashes. And what we do today is we look into this story and we grab onto providence, But a lot of times when I think of providence, I need it with skin on. I need it to be something like, how does God have an overarching sovereign hand over life? I think back to when I was a young man. Um, I had left Kona, Hawaii, where I'd been in school, and and I came home and I was going to start building with my dad. Um, I'd been in a really bad relationship, uh, a girlfriend of mine who isn't named Erica, boo. Um, So I regret dating her. She was a cougar. She was 12 years my senior, lesson to the boys. It's not as cool as it sounds. Um, And uh, she stole money from me. It's a whole different story. Um, So like, you know, I date this cougar and really what happened in the end is I was an emotional wreck. I didn't have any self-confidence, any self-worth. I was lower on cash than I was when I started. And um, things had gone really bad. And I'm not joking, like my, my belief in the call of God that God called me to be a pastor had not only waned, it had evaporated. I no longer believed. I was like, Maybe I just made that up. I don't know. I'm out. I went to my cousin Wendy to her wedding in Colorado. My cousin Wendy got married, and um, I sit down in my chair at the wedding. Uh, I'm sitting there, and the guy who founded Mercy Ships sits down right in front of me. His name's Don Stevens. We've known each other. I, he's known me all my life. I've known him all of mine. And he turns around, and he's like, hello. He has an awesome voice. Hello, Eric Folker. It's good to see you. And he's like, I would like to talk with me and I'm talk with you. And I'm like, no, you stay away from me, you missionary man who's going to ruin my life. I'm going to build houses and be richer than I am now as a poor missionary. Go away, Don. He didn't. 
He said, I'd really love to talk to you. And I was kind of like, ah, no, but he caught me afterwards. And he said, we would love to have you come aboard the Caribbean Mercy and staff a school, a discipleship training school, to which I was like, now I'm going to buy a cool truck and work. And, um, and what God did with that is he haunted my dreams and my every waking moment for the next 24 hours. And when you're ADD like I am, that's like a lifetime of consistent interruptions. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll call Don. So I called Don. He gave me the ship's number. I called them. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, that spot's been filled. To which I was like, hallelujah. And I was ready to go with that. So I was ready to be done with that. And I said, you know what? It's all good. No worries. I'm glad you got your spot filled. I'll just go back to uh, being a carpenter and building houses with my dad. And she squealed, which I thought very unprofessional on a phone call. And she squealed. She said, oh, we need a ship's carpenter. And I was like, what? (laughs) What? Who has a carpenter on a ship? You can't drill. Like, I just thought this was stupidest. They were so mad. I was not happy with God. August 25th, two days ago, 1997, I walked on board the Caribbean Mercy, and I walked through this classroom, and this bright-eyed, green, green-eyed Dutch girl comes up and says, hi, I'm Erica. And I was like, yes, you are. <laughs> right? I met my wife that night. By an act of providence, God brought together this guy who was just a broken soul. I mean, I didn't, Erica didn't like to be like hotly pursued, and I wasn't in any condition to chase after her. I just liked her. I thought she was cute as could be. I thought she was sweet, and I liked her, but the reality was um, I didn't trust myself enough to chase after her, and she kind of liked the challenge of a boy who wasn't just gobsmacked, and, um, and we fell in love, and I look at it, and I'm like, that's an act of providence in my life because here I am in Zeeland, Michigan, and trust me, after my first winter, without her, I wouldn't have stayed, and, um, and I look at it, and I go, you know, we went through vertigo and 14 amazing years at Vriesland, and then we're here at the foundry, and we have three beautiful kids and an amazing marriage. She's my best friend and my soulmate, and I didn't want to meet her according to how I first acted towards Don, but God, well, providence had a hand. God was sovereignly steering my life, and he continues to do so over the lives of Christians from the time of Joseph and Abraham all the way till now. There is a sovereign hand of God that leads and guides our story. The question is, will we participate with God where he's at work? Let's pick up the story of a providential God And the life of Joseph as, well, Genesis 45 unfolds. It opens like this. Joseph, now you got to remember, Joseph had this older brother Reuben, or, or Judah, forgive me, and Judah had kind of passed the test, proven that he wasn't a bad guy anymore, that he had changed, and he had shown Joseph, he said, no, don't don't keep Benjamin, take me, and Joseph was moved by this, and this is the follow-up to the brothers kind of showing that they had changed after what they had done to Joseph, and it says this, Joseph, can and do me a favor, go into your imagination a little bit. Like, think of it like, you know, the smooth, sandy um, stones of Egypt. Be in that place. Just kind of get there and just hear these words in context. Joseph could no longer contain his emotion in front of his attendants. So he yelled at them in a loud voice, get out of my presence. Get out of here. So his attendants left him. His servants left him. And there was no one left with Joseph and his brothers. And he began to weep loudly, so loudly that the Egyptians outside were like, "Mm, he's having a good cry. It was such a loud cry that Pharaoh's house heard the story of it. And then Joseph turns to his brothers and says something. Now remember, Joseph had been speaking to them in the tongue of the Egyptians in their language all this time using an interpreter. But Joseph turns to his brothers who are Hebrews and he says this phrase to them, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. I am Joseph. Can you imagine what it was like for those brothers who were standing there watching this Egyptian official have an emotional breakdown in front of them, kick out their servants thinking, oh, can we go too? And then he turns to them with tear-stained cheeks and he says, I am Joseph. I am the one. He says, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. Is dad still alive? The brothers stare back at him with open-mouthed terror. 
because they could not believe who stood before them, and they were absolutely terrified. Then Joseph said, come here, and he pulls his brothers close. Come here, come to me, come to me, and they come up close, and once they got close to him, he said these words, I am Joseph, the brother you sold into Egypt, but don't be dismayed, and don't feel angry at yourselves for selling me, because it was God's plan to save many lives. He sent me here, well, he sent me here ahead of you. For two years, there's been famine, and for five more, there will neither be planting nor harvest. So it was God's plan to save many lives by sending me ahead of you. So then, it wasn't you who sent me here, it was God. And it was the same God who made me like a father to Pharaoh. He made me Lord over Pharaoh's house. He made me king over all of Egypt. So do this. Hurry back home and say these words to dad. Your son Joseph wants you to know that God has made him Lord over all of Egypt. So come down here quickly and I will give you a place to live in the land of Goshen, and it will be near me, and I will be near you, and you and your children and your grandchildren and your flocks and your herds can be there, and you will be with me because there are five years left to this famine, and if you don't come now, your house will be ruined. And then Joseph turns to his brothers, and he looks at them, and he says, you now know and so does my brother Benjamin. You know who's talking to you, that it is me. It is Joseph who is talking to you. So you tell dad when you get home about all the honor that has been given to me and all you have seen in this land of Egypt. And you get dad down here quickly. The brothers standing with mouths still wide open, see this thing happen where Joseph rushes at Benjamin and he throws his arms around his little brother, Benjamin, the, the son of his mother, Rachel. There was only Joseph and Benjamin born to Rachel. Joseph throws his arms around Rachel and he weeps. And it says that Benjamin wraps his arms back around Joseph and they wept as they stood there. And then Joseph goes and kisses every one of his other brothers and he wept over them. And afterwards, the brothers talked. Like, what a cool thing for scripture to throw in there. There's all this cagey emotion. Like, it's like teriyaki. It's so sticky and like, whoa, a lot of weeping, a lot of dudes being afraid, like really kind of strange. And then there's this cool little line and afterwards, the brothers talked. A number of months ago, uh, Phil Harbison taught here, and he talked about the long journey he would have gone on. Joseph, in the beginning, before they sold him into slavery, he went on this like multiple days journey looking for his brothers, and when he spotted them, he came up to them, and he probably had been very lonely, very lonely on this long footpath that he was taking to find them. What do you think he wanted? Probably a meal? and a good conversation with his brothers. But instead, they assaulted him and threw him into the pit and sold him into slavery in Egypt. And I wonder how long Joseph had longed to have those words. Afterwards, the brothers talked with him. See, when we humanize and understand scripture, we realize Joseph is just like one of us. He needed connection, he needed value. We go on in the text. When the news of Joseph's brothers came, of Joseph's brothers coming to see Joseph, reached Pharaoh and all his officials, they were really happy about it. They were very pleased. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, load up their animals, take provisions for their journey, and bring your father, Bring your father and all of your families back here to Egypt and you will have the best of the land of Egypt. They will live off the fat of the land. You are also supposed to take with you these carts, like, you know, like donkeys pulling little carts. Take the carts for your wives and your children and get back here. And by the way, don't worry about your possessions. They can have anything they want out of the best of Egypt. It's all yours. So Joseph told his brothers, and the sons of Israel did this, just as Pharaoh had commanded. He gave them provisions 
for their journey. They were gonna go a little ways out into the scorched desert. He gave them food and different things. But I want you to remember, do you remember that in the beginning of this, Joseph had a coat? He had a coat that he wore, his dad gave him, the coat of many colors. And they took it and they ripped it and poured blood on it and said he was eaten. Listen to what Joseph does next. It says this, that after Joseph had given them the carts and everything they needed for provision for the journeys, he gave to each one of them a set of new clothes. To Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothes. And then to his father, he sent 10 donkeys, and it's the semi of the ancient world, loaded with grain and with bread and with provisions for his father's journey home. Remember, Jacob's 130 years old. When you hit a buck 30, you need a little extra for the road, right? Jo- Jacob needs these provisions. He sends it with him. He also sends 10 female donkeys on the journey as well. And they were loaded with the best things of Egypt. They were loaded down with the very best of Egypt. And they would be for the journey. And then Joseph sent his brothers out on their way and he's like, go to Canaan and come back. And there's a really interesting clip at the end of verse 24 and it says this, Joseph sends his brothers out and he says to them as they leave, don't fight on your way. Isn't that interesting? Like, like, it's like he just knows them. By the way, you're all doorknobs, don't fight, right? He knows how they feel. Do you get the emotion in this? Do you get the tension? Do you get that this Joseph who has endured so many hardships, so many prison cells, so many false accusations and isolations, do you get that when he saw his brothers, he erupted like a volcano because he loved them? He loved them and God had brought them back. Sometime later, between chapter 46 and chapter 50, a few things happen. First of all, Jacob, the father of Joseph, comes down to Egypt with all of the family and is reunited with his son in this beautiful reunion. There's a reunion that takes place and there's this reconciliation of families. Then Joseph takes his dad and introduces him to his new boss, dad, the king of the world. And uh, Jacob meets Pharaoh and what does Jacob do? Jacob looks at Pharaoh and he blesses him. He blesses Pharaoh. Then Jacob grows older and his eyes grow dim and he is at peace in his heart because he's seen his son that he thought lost. And he calls all his boys together and he blesses them. Jacob blesses each one of his children. And if you want to see a really cool root in scripture and you wonder where does the promise of the line of Judah start where it says that Judah will have a king reigning forever and Jesus is of that line of Judah, where does it happen? Genesis 49.10, when Judah blesses or when Jacob blesses Judah. That's where it happens. That's where it takes place. So it's this cool kind of moment where we see him blessing his sons. But then Jacob does something different. He has Joseph come near and Joseph presents to Jacob his two sons. He's had two sons at this time. And he presents to him Manasseh and Ephraim. And those two, Jacob claims. He says, those are my boys and I claim them for my own. They are the same to me as Simeon and Judah, to which they had to be like, Okay, once again slided, right? But he claims Manasseh and Ephraim for himself, and we know this because in the tribes of Israel, there's a half-tribe of Ephraim and a half-tribe of Manasseh. They are the sons of Jacob. So all this is going on, and then there's this really kind of heart-wrenching moment where we see Jacob, and it says he has blessed his sons, his heart is full, his life has been good His life has been redeemed. His sons are with him. And it says this kind of sweet thing. He pulled his feet up under him on the bed and he breathed his last. And he went to sleep with his fathers. And Joseph once again loses his dad. And all the questions come raging back. Well, what now that the thing that kept Joseph from annihilating the brothers? Well, dad's gone, so what's Joseph gonna do? Let's pick up in verse uh, chapter 50. It says this, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him? Like, that seems like a pretty significant thing. So they sent word to Joseph. 
Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs that they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to Joseph, get it again. Like, guys, if I could say anything to the church, we got to get over our aversion to emotion. He got a letter, and he wept. He just wept. And it goes on to say, his brothers then came to him, and they threw themselves down in front of Joseph, and they said to him, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God here? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Remember, Joseph was the architect of saving the grain over the period of the seven-year famine to keep the people alive. And Joseph's saying, look, you tried to do a bad thing. God redeemed it for good, and many lives are saved. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you, and I will provide for your children And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Here's what I know. You and I have been hurt in this life. I could ask the question, you know, let's just have a little fun. Who here has ever been hurt by something said or done to you in this life? This is where everybody raises their hand and you participate in church. Right? Right? Because somebody has looked at you. I remember when I first moved to San Diego and someone gave me the awesome name of Gilligan because I was a little lanky back then. I thickened up a bit. But, um, but back then when he said that, I was like, I super hate that name. And, some, and it stuck for a while, you know, buck tooth, big ear, about six foot tall, kind of gangly. It was rough. I didn't like it. I can think of a math teacher who ran me down all the time. I can think of people who bullied me. I can think of people who questioned me. I can think of that cougar who maligned me. I can think of all these different things that hurt me. And I will tell you this, I have license to hate them in my heart, except for this. Scripture tells a different story because Joseph had 10 times the things to hate about his brothers that I do about anyone else, and it says he spoke kindly to them. The church needs to understand it's our kindness that will reveal the love of God to the world. It's our strength and ability to restrain ourselves when we're justified in our rage because God intends it for good. God will redeem the broken, the stolen, and the lost years. God is in the business of redeeming what has been taken, and he does it for his glory. And the story of Joseph tells it so clearly. Clearly, First of all, Joseph trusted that God was in control. And the first thing Joseph trusted that God was controlling was his past. And when you trust that God's in control of your past, it frees you from hatred and the desire for revenge, period. That kind of trust allowed Joseph to forget the lost years in prisons, in pits, and on trade routes as a human slave and not enact vengeance or hatred against his brothers. Why? Because Joseph trusted in the character of God and that God had redeemed his past and he had made it purposeful, even though it was brutal, even though it was painful, even though it was unmerited and unjustified, God still redeemed it. And it speaks to your life today. There are things that have happened to people in this room, to me and to you, that need to be redeemed that are past, we don't know if God was in control. I wanna tell you something, God is in control. Providence, God has a sovereign hand in redeeming broken things. God didn't harm you, but he will redeem you. And it's important that the church holds on to that. Joseph also trusted that God was in control of his present position. Joseph had been put in a position presently to do something. His life was purposeful. And that kind of trust in the character of God allowed Joseph to fulfill his life's purpose. And what was that? The saving of many lives, but the keeping of the people of Israel, the sons of Israel. They would have died in the famine, but they didn't. Why? Why didn't they die? Because Joseph had a purpose, and his present position allowed him to live into his purpose. And what what that tells us is once again, that our past doesn't own us, our present is purposeful if we're in Christ and living according to the will of God. 
When we trust that God's in control of our present circumstances, then we can live with purpose, even if it really just kind of is lame right now. I don't know about you, but there are some days that are just, it's like being cut off in traffic time and time again. You know, it's like being forced to read Zealand Informed on Facebook all day. It's just a special form of torture. It's horrible, right? It's just a bunch of weird, pointless complaints, and you think, why God, why me, right? We have those days, but what if, what if our present position is purposeful in the eyes of God? How then do we treat the everyday, ordinary, mundane? We treat it as sacred because we realize God's purposes are not exempted in the ordinariness of our present position. The third thing we know is this. Joseph trusted that God was in control not only of his past, not only of his current position, but of his future. Joseph wasn't wondering, what do I do with my 401k when all the grain runs out and all the people don't need me? He's not making a retirement plan. He's living knowing that the God who secured a broken past gave present help and purpose would also take care of the future. He lived... Well, he lived long past the famine. The famine ended after five years, and yet Joseph remained in his position. Joseph lived after the reunion of his father, his brothers, their families, and their establishment in the land of Goshen. Joseph lived with purpose. He lived with purpose. And that kind of trust, knowing that God holds your future, allows you to be free from the need to seek revenge against those who you know have done you wrong. And it's hard to forget when someone's done you wrong. It's really hard to forget. But when we believe in the the sovereign providential hand of God, we understand that our past doesn't own us, that our present has such value, and that our future is held secure. How many times have we hit on this theme in this series, that God has a providential hand moving throughout our lives for one purpose, to know God and to make him known, period. Your life is supposed to make him known after you first experience the joy of knowing him. Christianity is not attending church. Christianity is being in a living, faithful relationship with God himself. So let's apply this to our lives real quick. Let's take a minute and apply it. Let's do it by answering this question. What is providence? What is providence? What does providence speak into our lives? I would say providence is seeing God above our circumstances. Providence is the ability to see God at work in spite of some really lousy circumstances, some really horrible events, not hating but trusting Not seeking revenge, but seeking restoration. Sounds really easy to say until you hate someone, until you want to get revenge on someone. But the reality is what when we trust that God has providential control of this world, that the will of God and the purposes of God will be fulfilled in our lives if we will trust him, it tells us this, that we're not bound to our circumstances. We're not bound to the things that have broken us. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 28. He says this, and by the way, the Apostle Paul, really awesome, living a couple thousand years later, guess what tribe the Apostle Paul hails out of? Benjamin, yay. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's a pretty fun fact, and I think you ought to tuck that in your heart. All right, um, so you got Paul, the apostle, right? And he is the writer of most of the New Testament. Two-thirds of the New Testament came off the end of Paul's pen, they got, or quill. He knew how to write. He was a scholarly man, and he wrote this. God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Can I just speak that over you and you hear it to you? God works all things together for good. God works all things together for good to those who love him and catch this and are called according to his purposes. You have a purpose in the heart of God. The question is, will you own it? Will you live into it? Because if you love him, you will. And God works together all things, not some things. God's not like, I'll work out most stuff, but there's some janky stuff in your past so we're not gonna deal with that. It's a secret, we'll hide it. No, no. God will work out all things. He'll work together all things for good. All things. And when I look at that, I wonder if we can hold on to such a big promise that God will work all things together. 
He'll put them together and he'll work them for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you are a Christian or you want to become a Christian or you have a human body, you are made in the image of God and called according to his purposes. The question left to answer is do you love him? Do you love him and will you follow? Will you live a life that allows God to work together all things for good for those who love him and are called? He promises to work it out. He promises to work it out. The question is, do we believe in the providence of God? Do we believe that God has an all-seeing, all-knowing hand on this life we live? Well, we do if we claim, Romans 8, 28, and we say over our lives that God will work all things together for good. For my life, I love him, and I am called according to his purpose. Amen? It's yours to claim. It's the promise of God. And I would say this, it's rooted and evidenced first in the life of Joseph. We see it in the life of Joseph. So my question comes back to you as the next thing. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Right now, we're starting to trust in our 401ks. The world's longest running bull market on Wall Street is currently going great, and our 401ks and retirements look really good until the next bear market hits, and we quit trusting in the market, and we all pull our stuff out because we lost half. If you trust in the stock market, if you trust in the economy, if you trust in our military, if you trust in a national identity, if you trust in anything above the Lord Jesus Christ, I will tell you this, you trust in something that will fail. It'll just fail. There is no God except the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to hold on to him. He is what we trust because we know this. If we trust, when we trust God, your perspective is completely altered when you trust God. Not just in words, but you start trusting in real life. You see every dollar that is put in your hand. You see every meeting that you're forced to sit through. You see every setback, success, and failure as something that wasn't thrown at you by the hand of God, but passed through the hand of God like he handed it to you. You begin to see his providence over your life and purpose and everything. And I will tell you, I have had weird experiences that I don't understand fully in my own life, where God speaks something to me, stop and pick up that piece of trash. And I'm like, oh no, because I, I have learned to discern when God speaks and he never says what I want to hear if I'm perfectly honest. It's some stupid, trivial thing that causes me to trust. And I'll be like, hang on, I, got I don't even know why. And I just go back and pick it up, and Eric is like, what? And I'm like, you know why. Don't ask right now, God, I don't know. I don't know, or God says, go back and say hi to that person. I don't want to say hi to them. I don't know them, I don't care, if I'm honest. So I go up and I'm like, hey, I know why. And I walk, I'm like, I don't know, hi. Hi, I'm trying to obey the providence of God. And sometimes we Christians forget that there are people out there praying some ridiculous prayers. Like, God, if you really love me, have somebody pick up that piece of garbage. And then there's some guy going, I don't know why I'm doing it. Feels stupid all day and I'm just doing this stuff and nothing gives witness to God. And they're like... <laughs> And you go, oh, why is that person crying? We don't notice because we're too wrapped up in ourselves to see the providential hand of God hearing the prayer they just prayed. There's people sitting in parks, dead alone on a bench, pondering putting a gun in their mouth and going, God, if I matter anything in this world, have one person say hi to me. I haven't been spoken to in years. Have one person say hi. And they get some weird crackhead looking pastor going, I don't know why I have to say hi to you. How's it going? Good. Hi. God loves you. And I walk off and I'm a horrible person, not knowing that God put it on my heart because they put it on his. When did we quit trusting the providence of God? What if we started playing on his terms? Oh, how much more fun would life be, right? Because you'd be like, I'm gonna say hi to you. What did you just pray? Instead of being awkward, just be like wildly trusting. 
Just be like, I'm going to pick up this piece of trash. Anybody pray about that? Like, have some fun with it. Let's quit pretending the Bible isn't living and active. Let's quit pretending that the Holy Spirit isn't nudging his church to do weird things that give witness to an amazing God. Your everyday, ordinary life is called to give witness to God because everything you get passes through his sovereign hand. And if it's brokenness you've been given, he will redeem it. Do you trust him? Who do you trust? The question for us must be answered, not sitting in a nice, maybe a little overly chilly um, sanctuary tonight, but it should be answered in the living lives we have out beyond these doors. When we encounter the real world, the real tensions, and we go to our high schools and our middle schools and our colleges, and God tells us to do something weird and out of the ordinary, do we trust him? When we're at work and we have an opportunity to give witness to God, do we trust him? Here's the challenge, here's the call. Do you trust him? Has the life of Joseph taught you anything if it should trust this, that the Lord works together for good all things for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And he's speaking to you. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for the raw emotion of this story, for the hope that's bound up in the story of Joseph, how the narrative comes alive and we recognize the tenderness and the weeping and the joy and the satisfaction and the reconciliation and the forgiveness and the absence of revenge, the absence of hatred. Now, there's so much hatred in our world. It seems so easy to choose hate. And so tonight, God, we choose trust. We trust that, God, you're at work doing things we probably can't see and discern, but we trust you. And we lay it on the line tonight, right before you, God, and we confess. We, your people, we trust, but maybe we need you to help us trust more. So we ask, help us in our unbelief. Help us to believe in action, not just in word. May we step into the next days and weeks as people who believe in providence, the hand of a God who is above our circumstances and calls us up out of them and into a life of glorified witness to him. May we know you through, through your word, through the prayer life we have, and then may we make you known through the providential hand of God in obedience to you. Help us to be brave enough to obey even when we don't understand. God, thank you that in this life we can count on this one thing, that your love has never failed those whom you love and have called according to your purposes. We receive the call and we respond. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, let's sing together. Stand up. I have a question for you, a little bit of a challenge. What if we just rewound the tape a little back to that moment where there's these brothers looking at an Egyptian and they think he doesn't speak their language. They think he's out of touch with their needs and their backstory and who they are and what they've done. And they think he's just some guy who's kind of being mean and playing games with them. And he leans in and he says in their tongue, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. Remember I told you scripture often echoes This is one of those moments, these revealed moments, where I think we could just say, what if we stood in front of God honestly and openly, and we didn't pretend that God's some mean, far-off person who doesn't know who we are, but he's actually deeply interested in us, and we didn't think that God wasn't aware of all our sins, and we didn't think that we could hide or do something or look really good. We just stood there and waited for Jesus to say, Ani, Yeshua, I am Jesus. I am still Lord over your circumstances. I am still the first word of creation. I am your savior. I am your redeemer. I am your creed. I am your hope. I am your purpose. What if we could just pull back a little and hear those words, Ani, Yeshua, I am Jesus, and hold on to the truth of who he is and not be so focused on what we are, what's happened to us and our circumstances. I believe this, if we could get our eyes on him, we could change this world. It is not so far gone that the love of Christ can't redeem everything because he died to do it. So your call is clear. Turn towards the one who is Lord over your circumstances and live in faithful relationship with the one who wants to know you in order to make himself known through you so that others may see and know 
that the purposes of God extend to your life. As you do that, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, the church must leave the building. You are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.